In STEM is a holistic mentorship and skills development program. We invite you to bring your whole selves into this virtual learning space. So before I turn it over to the experts, let's pause for a moment of mindfulness. Hi, I'm Kei Koizumi, and I'm a science policy practitioner, a science policy researcher, a teacher, and I hope a science policy mentor. I'm uh, also a social scientist, an economist, and a policy wonk, and I spent most of my career in Washington, D.C., working at the intersection of science and public policy, uh, mostly at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, and also at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, at, or OSTP, during the Obama administration. Mindfulness, I think of as, it's a basic human ability to be fully present and of, aware of where we are and what we're doing, and not overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. I, to me, it's a skill. And it has to be learned and, and cultivated, especially in this time when it's so difficult to be fully present in anything because of our phones and our social media and what's going on in our world. Uh, especially now, uh, sometimes that's all we have is the power to be fully present with who we are with and who we are, because it is difficult not to be overwhelmed. Now, I think I have a little bit of an advantage because my parents are Buddhist, I'm not, and they actively try to cultivate mindfulness, especially in their retirement. Um, so I'm trying to learn from them and I'm trying to be the same as well, to cultivate this mindfulness. And I think being mindful is something I've learned over a long time and I can tell you I certainly didn't have it when I was an undergrad um, or even in grad school because um, What's one of the regrets I have is that I wasn't fully present or fully mindful of where I was when I was at my freshman year in university or even when I was in grad school. So, you know, looking back on it now, I wish, well, I wish someone like me had told someone like you uh, that um, you should pay attention to where you are in the present. Um, and try to experience those moments. I'm a little bit uh, better at kind of turning the knob on mindfulness at, in life and work. So in my life, as I said, I try to be present and every day, and one way I can do that is to use social media, kind of use social media for me instead of against my mindfulness. So I do, you know, one post a day, not reacting to events about my life, and, uh, but doing, making it about my life and my environment. Basically, it's, you know, it's the 21st century version of a journal. And I don't even have to post publicly all my posts, but I do make one every day to honor that day. So in my work, in my science policy work, I try to have at least one interaction a day with intention. It could be, you know, a science meeting that I go to virtually. It could be, you know, talking to you uh, today, which it is. Or it could be, like yesterday, I sent a thank you note for someone's science presentation I really enjoyed. Or it could be mentoring someone starting a job in Washington, D.C., which I'm going to do tomorrow. Because for me, you know, mindfulness is being aware of who we are connected with. Um, and so I try to do one of those connected things a day for my science and my policy work. And it's one of those things that I wish I could have been better at before. For wellness, in times of heightened stress, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, during the pandemic lockdown in Washington, D.C., for me, it was getting out of the house to run on the National Mall six days a week. 
and a trip to the grocery store on that other day. Um, now I'm in Shanghai, China, um, so I think it's still running. So I'm running in Shanghai or doing some kind of exercise every day. It's good for my body, but it's also good for my mind because I can take in new sites, listen to a book or podcast or music. Um, and you know, especially in this pandemic time, it's easier to rely on like takeout or delivery for food all the time. But you know, to be well, two out of you know every three meals a day I make at home, and then the other one my husband and I go out somewhere because we can. So those are some of the ways in which I'm trying to cultivate wellness in this time of stress. But it could be really different in a different circumstance or in a different uh, in a different time. My one advice is make a plan for incorporating mindfulness and wellness. This is something I wish I'd done when I was in school. So let's make a plan for one thing you'll do each day to be mindful, to be present where you are. Be present for each other. Um, you are part of a cohort. You may not be physically in the same place, all of you, but you have the uh, ability to be present for each other. And maybe, you know, reach out to one of you a day and to see, see how they're doing, how you all are doing. Resilience, well, I looked it up. In a dictionary, it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or it's toughness. Um, but for me, I think for like 30 years, I've used, um, you know, I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never gonna keep me down. It's, a, it's a, a lyric quote from Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba in the early 1990s. So that's my definition. Um, so yeah, get up again after getting knocked down. That's, that's my resilience definition. But it also means you know, having a strong enough balance to keep from getting knocked down by life in the first place because we are all going to get knocked down or tested or, or knocked around by life. In 2009, I started at the White House in the first year of the Obama administration. And one of my jobs was to implement some of the science-related campaign promises that President Obama made on the campaign trail. Uh, one of those promises was he pledged to triple the number of graduate research fellowships that the National Science Foundation offered from 1,000 a year to 3,000 a year. So my job was to make it happen. Um, and as you can imagine, that was difficult because that pledge required money. And, even, and my specialty was federal funding for research. So my task was to come up with the money and also the policy and the buy-in from all the people who needed to buy in, including the Congress, the National Science Foundation, and scientists from all over the federal government. Um, it, was, it did not get done in 2009 because there was one obstacle after another, whether it was, oh, this year we don't have enough money to do that. Or the next year was like, well, NSF isn't sure that, you know, 3,000, that there will be even 3,000 qualified students who could do that every year. Um, so, you know, I had to like keep trying because I felt like this policy goal was, co was continually getting knocked down. Uh, but we were never knocked out uh, until, you know, four years later, in 2013, we finally got to the point where NSF was offering 2,000, you know, double the number of uh, graduate research fellowships than it had uh, offered before. Uh, at that point, we, th we realized, well, we're not going to quite get to 3,000, so let's call double the number and call it a victory. And we did. Um, so I think the re lesson I take from that is you have to keep trying. Uh, you have to like keep going back into the fight, uh, absorbing the punches, I hope landing a few of your own, um, and then if necessary, like declare victory on a goal that isn't quite what you originally set out to do, but is still a victory because, be, you know, thanks to that commitment and living up to it, a thousand more U.S. students a year are having their graduate science education supported by the National Science Foundation. I do try to keep my eyes on the prize, and in that example, the prize is 
people, you know, real people, real students who have the chance to pursue science and engineering careers because of a policy that I'm working on. So that's the prize that I always try to keep in mind. In my professional life, how do I cope? I think I cope because, you know, I think of, you know, my tools as part of a toolkit. I mean, I carry around with me a policy toolkit. Um, and that inv involves, you know, my experience in gaining and using a lot of tools. And for me, the tools that I use are things like legislation, writing bills, calling members of Congress and their staffs. It's going through federal budgets, finding a program that could help support an idea that we're working on, bringing together the right people in a room to hammer out a compromise for a way forward. So that's what I've been doing for a lot of my career ever since grad school is to putting together a toolkit of ways to make policy happen. And for, you know, personally, you know, I have a coping toolkit as well. And the only, and it's not something that you can pick up in your freshman year or, or just over a year. It's something that you pick up over time. For me, tools are things like calling a friend, you know, escaping to a book, taking a deep breath for 10 seconds, um, turning off the phone off so I can focus, you know, calling a mentor, um, even watching a few TikTok videos, but only a few. I think my identity and experiences shape everything about the way I see and interact with my environment. Uh, right, for example, right now, I'm in Shanghai. I mean, so for one of the f few times in my life, because I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, I'm surrounded by Asians. You know, racially, I'm in the majority and my white husband is the minority. And that feels good sometimes, let me tell you. But I'm not really in the majority because I'm Asian American. So I, I don't understand what people are saying because I don't speak Chinese yet. So everyone looks at me and starts talking Mandarin, Mandarin and I have to point to my husband and say, oh, he speaks Chinese, I don't. Uh, you know, but thank God my parents, who are Japanese, made me learn Japanese because at least I can look around and instantly read signs because the alphabet is the same in Japanese and in Chinese. So in policy, you know, in my work, my identities and experience help me make sense of the world and the data. So in my work, I, I work with, you know, research universities. So to make sense of, you know, lots and lots of data, billions of dollars about universities, I use touchstones. You know, my touchstones are Ohio State University, which is where I grew up, uh, and also Boston University, which is where I went to undergrad. So when I look at all these data about, you know, how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting research universities, I tend to zoom in on, well, how's it going for Ohio State? How's it going for BU? So for undergraduate research programs, another topic that I work on, you know, I, I try to think in terms of how would all of these programs that are out there look to someone like me whose parents have no experience with applying to or attending U.S. colleges. You know, my parents never had no idea what the SAT, ACT were. They had never applied to colleges in the United States. So um, for me, it was confusing trying to get a hold of these programs to help me get to college, uh, as it might have been for you. But that part of my identity really helps me now to try to see what impact policies to help kids go to college might look like for someone who doesn't have the skills of navigating them in their family. So, and it remains true for, I, for, for policies like immigration. So in science policy, we're still looking at high-skilled immigration policy, green cards, the dreamers. Um, so for me, this is personal because I'm in the United States, or I was in the United States, because the 1965 Immigration Act allowed my parents to come to the United States and get their green cards. But I know from their experience that it wasn't easy. 
although it's easier then than it is now. So that kind of part of my identity helps me in my work because I understand you know, deeply and personally how immigration policy, uh, immigration policy that affects scientists and engineers who want to come to the United States, really makes a difference in the real world. So, I mean, what I try to tell you uh, and everyone is that all of this is valuable. Your experiences, your identity, um, they are your lenses through which you can see the world. And so polish these lenses and use them in your studies and in your work. Um, one of the books that I've been listening to re recently is Michelle Obama's memoir, Becoming. So what I learned from that book, among others, is that one of Michelle Obama's lenses is her experience in the south side of Chicago. So what's your lens? How do you see the world? Um, and once you figure that out, don't be afraid to use that lens to see the world. We hope you found this useful. For more videos in this series, please visit us at nationalmedals.org backslash in STEM.